Nicholas de Genova, editor of the Borders of Europe, Autonomy of Migration, Tactics of Bordering with Duke University Press, and author of the forthcoming books, The Migrant Metropolis and The European Question, Migration, Race and Postcoloniality, among many other publications. There is a lot of discussion of the migration crisis in Europe at the moment. How should we understand this crisis? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we've seen an incredible proliferation of this language of crisis. Um, and it's useful to be reminded that the, the so-called migrant or refugee crisis is, is not the only one. Um, that indeed, we've, since 2008, we've you know, lived with the permanent language of the, the crisis that refers to the, the economic crisis or the financial crisis or the debt crisis. Um, so you've got um, a whole variety of languages of crisis and emergency that have kind of coexisted and have, and have become kind of the defining feature of, um, of our existence, as it were. Um, my, my particular interest in migration means that uh, in the European context, that the migrant crisis, so-called, or the refugee crisis, uh, became an important flashpoint for understanding, um, you know, sort of central questions about migration and borders, but also about Europe as such. Um, so, um, so as you can already detect from what I've said, um, I'm trying to introduce a certain skepticism, a certain critical distance from the very language of crisis. Uh, because indeed what gets constructed as a crisis um, related to migrant and refugee movements uh, is largely um, constructed in that way because it's a crisis of control. It's a crisis of control on the part of state power with respect to borders and what uh, is you know, in a peculiar euphemism called the management of migration. Um, and on the other hand, um, what has been labeled the migrant or refugee crisis really represented in an important way and in an abundant way um, the primacy and autonomy of migrant and refugee movements. The fact that, that every tactic of bordering ends up uh, really being a reaction formation that responds to something that came first which was the freedom of movement of migrants and refugees. Um, the actual appropriation of movement uh, by migrants and refugees who, in an objective sense, are defying borders and subverting borders by crossing them and disregarding in that respect uh, the authority of the state or of multiple states or of the sovereign power of the EU in this case um, in favor of making a priority of their immediate human needs and uh, aspirations. Um, and so in that sense, um, you know, the, while I'm skeptical and critical of the language of crisis, um, you know, and want to recognize that, that, um, that migrant and refugee autonomies and subjectivities um, really uh, really are what prevailed um, and at the same time you know I don't want to I don't want to disregard the fact that many of the contexts um, in which migrants and refugees engaged in these border struggles if we if we can call them that um, nevertheless presented them with real crises crises for the simple uh, reproduction of human of human life and uh, the crises for you know sustaining their own prospects for um, a life with dignity um, that originate of course in contexts of many times of conflict and violence if not persecution um, and in other instances contexts of uh, you know endemic deprivation and poverty um, so this reminds us that we live in a world order racked by crisis of you know of of, of crisis, crises of a whole variety of different kinds, um, and we need to sort of look for you know the variety of connections that that make it impossible any longer to sustain the artifice that 
Europe as a place of stability and peace, uh, intruded upon by you know these you know uh, masses of denizens who are fleeing some kind of chaos elsewhere. Um, that the chaos elsewhere, in many ways, is the historical product, at least, if not the direct product, of various kinds of European intervention, militarily, politically, and economically. That that we live in a world of interconnections, and we need to see those crises as uh, as partly the product of uh, you know of Europe itself. In that sense, you know, there's a deeply post-colonial character to the migrant and refugee movements that then reclaim the space of Europe and are, in that sense, remaking Europe uh, before our eyes. So, f from that perspective, um, you could argue that a useful starting point for a rethinking and re of such fields as cultural studies and post-colonial studies, migration studies, is that mobility should be understood to be an element of the human condition. What type of work does that alternative starting point encourage and make possible? Yeah, I, you know, I really like to say that if there were no borders, there would be no migration. Um, there would be no, if there were no borders, there'd be no migrants or refugees. There would be only mobility. Um, and indeed, mobility should be understood to be an effectively ontological feature of human being, of the human condition. Um, so that a, a freedom of movement for me is not uh, about rights. It's not something juridically inscribed. Uh, freedom of movement is an exercise, a practice, and, uh, and refers to an elementary feature of the human condition. Um, and so indeed, on a, on a global scale, the human species exists in a relationship to the planet that has never accepted to recognize any boundary, certainly not any ecological or geographical boundary, um, uh, you know, and um, you know has managed to circumvent and surpass every kind of barrier. Um, and in that sense, the most profound barriers and the most uh, the most violent ones are the ones that we've constructed ourselves um, through, uh, you know, in particular, particularly through the borders of nation states that have arisen really in a relatively shallow historical time horizon. Mm. So this is really something quite new in, mm. uh, in the human experience, that, mm. that we would live in a world that is so completely uh, and comprehensively crisscrossed by these increasingly uh, you know, razor wire mm. fences and barricades. Mm. Um, and that kind of um, increasingly militarized and securitized bordering um, obviously um, has been on the rise for, for many years and, um, um, you know, and seems to be you know, a pervasive feature mm -hmm. of um, a kind of state sovereignty that is in, uh, you know, that is in many ways uh, in deep distress. Mm -hmm. um, but from that point of view then, um, it seems to me crucial to, to think about um, if we want to say cultural studies broadly, post-colonial studies, and um, you know, and migration studies more specifically, um, that we need to take as a first premise, as a basic assumption, the mobility of human beings um, as a starting point, that, that to recognize that all of these different tactics and technologies for for producing borders really come as a reaction, as a response to something that that came first, which is the, the inclination of human beings to find the way to yeah. move around in order to realize their projects of, you know, mm -hmm. whatever those projects may be. Um, and, you know, and in that sense, we're, we're, really, we're really looking at, um, in an objective sense, a kind of world order being called into question, a world order predicated on nationalism and borders being called into question in an objective sense by people's practices, by people's exercise of this elementary freedom of movement. Um, that, it seems to me, gives us the basis to produce a critical scholarship that can begin to envision that a different world is possible. That scholarship seems to transcend 
the typical work of the scholar, though, uh, in the way that you describe it. So, so it, to some extent, it suggests that the scholar also needs to become, to some extent, an activist. Uh, so, do, would you agree with that? Does the perspective you propose encourage the transformation of the scholar also into an agent of positive, but but also potentially radical political and economic change? Yeah, I, um, I certainly don't think that one necessarily should take away from what I'm saying that every that every scholar has to be an activist, mm. uh, or in any case, mm. I think that we could have a very broad concept of of um, the different ways that activism might be defined. Mm. But I think that but I think that what's more important is uh, an elementary insight of postcolonial studies, mm. which is that we are, um, to use a phrase from Edward Said, we are of the connections. Mm. And this is something that, you know, an, an insight that's been, um, you know, very important in defining what a postcolonial critique is about, mm. you know, um, the interlacing and concatenation of, of um, relations on a global scale that are inseparable from hundreds of years of colonialism mean that there are these very meaningful, consequential social and political connections uh, between parts of the world that otherwise might appear to be remote. Uh, and certainly in, you know, in the sort of, um, in the era of deep colonization um, have been made to look still more separate by the proliferation on a you know virtually universal global scale of the nation form uh, and the nation state form uh, means that you know apparently everybody belongs to some to some separate country and some of those historical interconnections then are obfuscated thereby. But one of the most elementary connect uh, you know um, insights of postcolonial studies is about being able to reveal those connections and uh, and that means that we're all implicated. And that means that as, that as scholars, when we produce scholarship, we are of the connections. Uh, and we have to produce uh, a responsible, honest, and objective account of where we stand. Mm -hmm. And so from my point of view, uh, it's not as if there is a kind of conventional scholarship which is neutral, mm -hmm. and then an activist scholarship which is about taking mm -hmm. a stand. Um, that instead what presents itself as neutral and objective uh, has always been taking a position that disguises itself as some kind of pure science um, that somehow is removed from the world, that somehow is not implicated socially and politically. It seems to me the reality is every scholar is always located in meaningful ways socially and politically and has to produce an account of that. That to me is objectivity, right? And that means that you provide an honest account of how you're situated subjectively in order to provide the most objective scholarship. Um, but that also means that then we take responsibility for the inequalities and hierarchies that actually constitute our place in the world in relationship to what we study. And, um, and you know, that we're compelled, therefore, to be that much more explicit that much more articulate about how we take a stand, where we stand, um, what ground it is that we stand upon, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. In post-colonial studies, the, f the focus has often been the subaltern, and the subaltern has often existed as a, um, a subject living outside of Europe, where post-colonial studies has been performed, in many cases by European scholars. What happens to post-colonial studies when the migrant enters Europe and the migrant becomes a new focus for, for much post-colonial studies? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a crucial question, it seems to me, because um, in my view, the study of migration, you know, needs to be at the forefront of post-colonial studies. Mm -hmm. That... Um, Certainly, it doesn't exhaust, or preclude, or, or otherwise uh, diminish the whole variety of ways in which people have conducted postcolonial studies um, um, in you know formerly colonized 
mm-hmm. countries. But it seems to me that one of the deepest contributions of post-colonial studies has always been to mm-hmm. say that one cannot understand the former colonial metropole mm-hmm. except through the lens of that experience of that history. Um, and that then, you know, that then has deep ramifications that have not been sufficiently uh, borne out by scholarship in general for, you know, the very, the very historical narratives that we construct about, you know, European countries, for example, um, and about the very idea of Europe as such on a larger scale. And this is more important now than ever with the existence of the European Union, with the existence of uh, European borders, and so forth. Um, but um, the other the other point is that you know rather than allow for this kind of post-colonial retreat of the formerly colonial powers into the hermetically sealed confines of their national boundaries, um, when you know for hundreds of years sometimes we are talking about uh, a global misadventure uh, on the part of these same countries that produced their power and their wealth and their prestige, um, where the very foundations for uh, you know the, the wealth of various European countries was precisely the labor of people in the colonized countries elsewhere than in Europe. Um, when, when the descendants of those people begin to arrive at the doorstep of Europe and say, you know, we've come back, um, then we can be reminded of, uh, uh, of a famous phrase of Malcolm X, the chickens have come home to roost. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so there's, so there's a deeply post-colonial character to the reality of who is migrating to Europe today, whether, whether as refugees or, um, or otherwise, uh, you, know, um, you know, as migrants looking uh, for economic opportunity if we want to sort of rely on a very problematic distinction that I can say more about separately, but um, but when we look at who is who is arriving in Europe, um, then and we recognize that the, these historical interconnections, uh, the interrelations that post-colonialism is all about, are being manifested within Europe itself. Um, and we're also reminded of the fact that there's really in my view, not a single discourse of migration ever in the European context that doesn't always carry with it a subtext which is racial. You know, um, that migration itself, as a as a term, tends to operate as a proxy for race in many European discourses, um, and that we therefore, you know, are brought face to face with precisely the legacies of of what. Uh, hundreds of years of colonialism, European colonialism, has meant for the world, which is to say a world socio-political order predicated upon white supremacy. And that means that today, in remarkable ways, uh, the very notion of Europe, the very notion of European identity is being kind of uh, reinvented as a post-colonial racial formation of whiteness. Um, And you can see the whole proliferation of new kinds of anti-immigrant uh, far-right politics that increasingly and in a remarkable way are embracing the notion of Europeanness. Yeah. Right. So if you look at Pegida in Germany, for example, the name itself is Patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of the West. Um, so what is this kind of patriotic Europeanism that we're encountering? Uh, similarly, if you look at um, Anders Breivik's um, manifesto, it was called the European Declaration of Independence, right? So you see that you see the the emergence of new um, new discourses of Europeanness that are very much posited in reaction to and in relation to the sheer fact and presence of migrants in the European context and uh, and its deeply racial underpinnings. Um, I think. You know, from that point of view, that's absolutely a necessary frontier for post-colonial studies.